Before the birth of Moneyball, scouts evaluated players primarily using the eye test, meaning you assess a player's skill and value using your eyes instead of the stat sheet. But no one has the time to watch all 82 games to do that, which is why we have a box score to get a very general sense of what may have happened on the court. The box score is not the most efficient way of understanding how things transpired on the court, but its purpose is to be the most accessible and easiest to read for fans. If you notice all box score numbers such as points, rebounds, and assists, these stats only show the result of every play, but not how the play developed. This is really important because basketball is much more than just the final result of each possession. Every movement, ball or man, is used to set up the next action. Take Steph Curry for example. We know that he is the best shooter of all time, but his gravity is what makes the Warriors so dangerous. Remember the 2017 finals when the Cavs were willing to give up Durant dunks on the break instead of letting Curry take threes? This would never show up in the box score, but if you watched the play, you would instantly know that Curry helped Durant get those easy dunks. Here's a more subtle one. So Jokic is going to get doubled here and Jamal Murray cuts, which draws in Landry Shamit, leaving Torrey Curry open on the wing, eventually resulting in an open three for Millsap. The players that would get credited for that play is Craig for the assist and Millsap for the three, but the two movements that made this happen were Jokic's pass out of the double team and Murray's cut, which left Craig free. Stats are often misused because of the lack of context. Let's take Russell Westbrook's MVP season where he averaged a triple-double. The media praised him for being able to accomplish this feat and his ability to carry the Thunder to the playoffs that year. Now his season was impressive, but the media seemed to miss how at times Westbrook would intentionally try stat padding primarily for assists and rebounds. Take a look here, we're in his one assist away from a triple-double against the Suns. This type of play can really hurt a team when he's intentionally trying to reach an individual accomplishment and that's just one of many ways that stats don't show any context. Not all numbers are created equally either. A player can get an assist from making a simple pass or drawing in a defense and kicking it out for three. Rajon Rondo is a pretty good example of this. It's undeniable that his passing is his strongest skill, but it doesn't mean all his assists were created equally. He made a living as a Boston Celtic, setting up teammates primarily Ray Allen coming off pin downs and Kevin Garnett from pick and pops. Compare that to the play I just showed with the Joker. He makes this pass out of the post look easy, but it's a much more difficult play to make than Rondo's passing. Jokic's presence already causes so much attention on the defense, and the pass sets up the score, but he doesn't get credit for anything on this possession while Rondo gets credit for making basic passes to the big three. And for these reasons, the NBA started creating advanced analytics in an attempt to better show a player's true value on the court. The most commonly used ones that you may have heard of are PER, usage rate, and offensive and defensive efficiency. Now I don't believe all advanced analytics are useful, but I wanted to go through a couple that may show more about an NBA player than just what you see on the box score. The first one is true shooting percentage, which was an attempt to replace field goal percentage. Field goal percentage is calculated by taking in a player's field goals made and dividing it by field goals attempted. The biggest issue with this stat is that it doesn't show what type of shots you are taking. James Harden is a great example of this. He only shoots 44% from the field on high volume, which is below the league average of 46%, but you need to look closer than that. 55% of Harden shots are three pointers and they're often tough step back threes. He's taking these shots because threes are worth more than twos by 50%. To understand why a three-pointer is a more efficient shot, a 33% three-point shooter would score just as much as a 50% two-point shooter, based on simple math. The box score would make Harden look like an inefficient high-volume scorer, but true shooting percentage would show the opposite. This stat takes into account points, free throws, and field goals attempted as a measure to show scoring efficiency. This is important because free throws are the most efficient shot in basketball, but they don't show up in field goal percentage. Harden is one of the best at getting to the free throw line even though he does exaggerate contact at times, and not surprisingly enough, he had a 62.7 true shooting percentage this past season, which is right behind Damian Lillard for the best among guards. Without this stat, we would probably believe that Harden is an inefficient volume scorer that advanced analytics takes more into account to create a more complete picture. The other one I wanted to go over is points per 100 possessions versus points. Both of the following statements I'm about to say can be true. The New Orleans Pelicans scored the 5th most points while the Celtics scored the 10th most, but the Celtics had a better offense than the Pelicans in the 2019-20 season. The stat points scored misses a lot of key factors. How much pace are teams playing with? How many possessions are in the game? 
To control those factors more, John Hollinger came up with points per 100 possessions to measure scoring efficiency versus total points. In basketball, the best way to win is to maximize each offensive possession versus trying to attain as many possessions as possible. The purpose of this stat is used to control the number of opportunities teams had to score. So if we take a closer look at the Pelicans and Celtics offense, the Pelicans played at the second highest pace of 106.3 versus the Celtics who were 16th in pace. This means that the Pelicans had more offensive possessions to work with than the Celtics, but they didn't maximize it as well as Boston did. You can also use this stat with individual players as well. Take a look at someone like Duncan Robinson versus Rudy Gobert. In this past season, Gobert averaged 15.1 points per game, which is pretty good for a big man, versus Duncan Robinson who averaged only 13 points. If a player just looked at their numbers, they may say that Gobert is the better offensive player because he scores more points and at a better field goal percentage, but as NBA fans, it's probably a general consensus that Duncan Robinson is a much bigger offensive threat on the floor than Gobert because of his amazing three-point shooting. If you look at points per 100 possessions, Robinson would average 22.2 points while Gobert would score 21.4, and this doesn't even take into account how Robinson's body movement opens up shots for his teammate. Now, even though I'm an advocate for advanced analytics, there is no stat that can show everything. Some may argue that true shooting percentage puts too much emphasis on free throws, and it is important to not use only one stat to make a case for a player. If you've made it this far, here is what I would take away from this video. Field goal percentage is not a good indicator of trying to show if a player is scoring efficiently. The box score is the quickest way to get a sense of what may have happened, but misses a lot when it comes down to player impact, and advanced analytics are used to help control some factors that make box score numbers misleading. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time.